right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Today, we're continuing an exciting 10 event series, exploring some amazing places around the world with the Darwin 200. So this is all just a big warm up to the epic Darwin 200 expedition, which is departing in 2023, that will travel our ocean by tall ship following Darwin's voyage of the Beagle, making some incredible stops along the way. And we'll be broadcasting live each week during this two year epic expedition. In today's event, we're gonna explore the Falkland Islands. So located in the Southern Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Argentina, this group of islands is one of the last great wilderness destinations on our planet. And I can think of no better guide to get us started than the amazing Stu McPherson. So Stu is a biologist, he is an author, he is the brain power behind the Darwin 200 expedition. Uh, and I'm gonna bring him in right now live from the UK. <laughs> hey Stu, how you doing? Lovely to speak to you today, Joe, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm not sure I deserve all that, but um, it's, uh, it's lovely to, to be here. And thank you so much for, um, for allowing us to present an overview of the beautiful Falkland Islands. Of course. Well, Stu, we've got an amazing group of classrooms with us. We can see a bunch of them hanging out backstage on camera. There's more tuning in live via YouTube. We've got presentations, conservation. We're going to have a Kahoot for prizes. It's going to be a pretty awesome event today. Absolutely. We've got um, three Kahoots prizes of £50 or roughly $55 US dollars to give away as Amazon vouchers and another culture of stick insects. Um, we've had lots of wonderful entries coming in over the last few days of drawings of polar animals. And so we can announce the winner of that of that um, prize as well at the end of today. So, um, so, yeah, we've got some exciting prizes to give away. All right. Well, I'm going to tuck myself away and I am going to let you take us to the Falkland Islands. Beautiful. All righty, I'll share my screen and hopefully with a bit of luck, a bit of StreamYard magic, hopefully you can see my, my screen now. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, it looks good, Stu. Perfect. Okay, well, um, thank you again so much for, for coming to this talk today. Um, my hope today in about 10 minutes is to give you an overview of this incredible place and then hand over to Caroline who's an inspiring conservationist that will tell her tell you about some of her work. So um, I guess it's true to say that many people don't know that much about the Falkland Islands or where they are or what wildlife they hold, but they're one of those little hidden secrets around the world with some of the most surprising and amazing wildlife and conservation stories. So for those that don't know, they're located right down at the bottom of the south of South America. So if you look right down at the tip, you'll see a little group of islands at the bottom. Those are the Falkland Islands. Um, so here's a close up. And you can see that they're, as, as Joe kindly said, they're the bottom of the South Atlantic or basically bordering the, the great Southern Ocean that, that, that swirls around Antarctica. So they're in a really interesting place. They're, they're close to South America, but also isolated. And that has some really interesting um, consequences for the wildlife that, um, that you'll see over, over my talk. So the island group itself, it's an archipelago, which means a group of islands. There's two big islands, East Falkland and West Falkland, and over 700 little islands scattered all the way around the archipelago, um, as you can see here. There's only about 2,800 or 900 approximately people that live across, um, across the Falklands. And most of them live in a little town called Stanley, which is the capital over on, on East Falkland that you're going to see. Now you might think close to Antarctica, it's a cold, wet place, but it's a place of astonishing landscapes and um, an astonishing beauty. First of all, it has some of the most beautiful white beaches I've ever seen. Um, obviously the water is, is quite chilly, so don't think of the, the Caribbean in terms of white beaches and warm water but still they are some of the most beautiful, dazzling waters and beaches that you'll ever see anywhere in the world. Um, but of course, mixed in with this dazzling landscape, a penguin, seals, and a whole range of other animals that you're going to see uh, over this talk. For the last well, 200 years or so, the islands have been very, very important for ships that sail around the Southern tip of South America. They were called a, a victualling station. So a, a place where, where ships would call in and get supplies and, and get food and water and so forth. 
So over the years, there were many, many, many shipwrecks just by the number of ships that were coming in. And when you go to the Falkland Islands today, you can't help but see some of these big, spectacular wrecks right near Stanley, the, the capital. There's um, a really big wreck called the Lady Elizabeth, which I believe is about 100 years old. And her, her rusting iron hull is kind of a landmark that you can't really miss. Um, it's, it's very clear from, from the capital, really interesting to, to see. Well, Stanley itself is an incredible place and a really charming town. Um, I believe it's, it's the southernmost capital city in the world. And it, it's a, a complicated mix of, of architecture that reflects the UK, but also its own distinctive taste and, and culture as well. Um, it's home to some of the world's most southerly pubs where you can have fish and chips um, right on the, the southern tip of, of, of South America. So it's a, a really, really interesting place in, in that sense. And this particular pub, the Globe Tavern, is a bit of a local icon. And so if you ever visit the Falkland Islands, you definitely have to visit this place and, and try some of the, the beautiful local food that they, that they have there. Um, for hundreds of years, Stanley has been uh, connected to exploration of Antarctica. It's where many of the great explorers stopped at, either on their journeys to or from Antarctica, including, including Shackleton, uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton, his great adventures, who I know you've heard uh, through other Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants talks. But it also has a really interesting connection to the whaling industry that, that, that continued right up into the 60s. And kind of echoing that, outside one of the large churches in Stanley, there's a whalebone arch made of three jawbones of these great whales. Obviously, you're going to hear about the conservation of these great whales um, in Caroline's speech, but it's just a really interesting connection to the past, this arch. Um, so if you put your hands on your mouth, on your jaw, your, your jaw bones at the bottom of your mouth, you've, you've got basically, it forms like an arc on the bottom of your mouth. Um, if you then look at this arc, this arch, and see how enormous these whale jaw bones are, that gives you a bit of an idea of the scale and the size of these huge baleen whales. Stanley's a really, really colourful place. Um, it's home to the majority of the people that live in the Falkland Islands. And today it's really busy with lots of ships that go to Antarctica. Um, it's, a, it's an important place where the ships call in um, before heading south to the Great White Continent. Many of the Falkland Islanders, though, still live on many of the really remote islands, um, and more so in the past in particular, Sometimes ships, supply ships would call in just once or twice a year and resupply these communities on really, really remote islands. And, um, and interestingly, again, more so really in the past, but many of the students even went to school by radio. So imagine, uh, imagine learning your lessons and so forth by radio uh, connections to some of the really remote islands. That's less so today, but still, it's a really interesting part of the, the history of this amazing archipelago of islands. Also, traditionally, it was a very important uh, place for sheep farming. Again, less so today. It, it's less important um, as part of the economy of the islands today. But still, it has this really interesting history of these ranches of sheep um, across this beautiful landscape. And so if you go across the islands today, you'll see these really remote farmhouses and and Astanthias out in the in the in the camp, which is the the wild areas beyond Stanley. That's what it's called. It's called the camp. The landscape is is um, a really beautiful mix of of low subantarctic tundra and, and heathland. It's a beautiful landscape. I think it's one of the most enchanting of anywhere I've been personally. Um, it's it's dramatic. It's windswept, and it has spectacular formations of rock and so-called these rock rivers that, that come out um, from some of the, the island, the, the um, outcrops of rock and stone. Uh, so it's a really dramatic landscape that, that um, the, the wildlife is set in. Well, as I mentioned earlier today, it's still used very much as a stopping point for the ships that go to Antarctica. These are two of the little um, vessels, the Golden Fleece and the Hans Hansen, that I was very lucky to, to go to Antarctica on a few years ago. Um, but some of the really big cruise ships also call in here. But many people also visit the islands for their amazing wildlife. Um, it's very hard to summarise some of the incredible range of animals and plants that the Falkland Islands are home to. But, but in a nutshell, in a few minutes, here's some of the highlights. 
So one of the first things that you'll see when you visit the islands by boat um, are one of the world's smallest species of cetaceans. These are called Cormosons dolphins. Um, in some parts, they're also known as sea pandas because of their black and white coloration. And they're just over about a, a meter, just over a meter or so in size. And they're incredibly playful. They jump out of the water around the bows of the, of the ships and also cruise along the waters. This is a, a photo I snapped just literally along one of the beaches um, and the, the dolphins play in the waters. The Cormorson dolphins play in the waters just as the, uh, as, as the waters break, the waves break on the shores. The islands are also home to five species of penguins that are all really, really easy to see. Um, and this is one of the wonderful things in the Falkland Islands. Many people say that they're a, a wildlife secret because they have many of the incredible animals that Antarctica and South Georgia have but without the long sea journeys. So if anyone wants to see penguins but doesn't want to go uh, on a boat, then you can fly to the Falkland Islands and see some of these amazing animals up close. Many of the colonies of penguins um, just form large masses on the beaches, right near, relatively close to the settlements, including Stanley. Um, the biggest is this beautiful species, the king penguin, of which many thousand nest on the Falkland Islands each year and raise their chicks. Because if you if you attended our last Nature Hour event on South Georgia, you might have learned this extraordinary parallel uh, paradox that even though these islands are quite cold and, and wet and windy, they're a haven for wildlife because many of these species of Antarctic and subantarctic wildlife can't breed on Antarctica. So they move north during the winters and, and concentrate on islands where there's a little bit of land, and a little bit of warmth to raise their chicks. So in a way, you can think of the Falkland Islands as a magnet pulling hundreds of thousands of, of seabirds and marine mammals each year that come to this beautiful group of islands to, to rear their young and, and overwinter. And that's certainly true for albatrosses. Um, the Falkland Islands are home to the world's largest population of, of albatrosses on Steeple Jason Island. Um, this is the black-browed albatross colony, uh, as you can see here. Um, I believe, and Caroline might correct me later, but I, I believe if I remember correctly, it's about home to, to 200,000 pairs, which is an immense colony. And I believe it's the largest in the entire world. And the albatrosses form these, these special raised nests in which they lay their eggs. If you look really carefully here, um, you can see the big fat fluffy chicks. Those are the gray chicks with the black beaks um, sitting on their nests, um, amongst of which there's some of the adult um, black-browed albatrosses, which are black and white with the pink beaks. And there's a few penguins dotted in between them as well. Um, so if you can imagine the noise, the sounds, the squawking, just the immense cacophony of sounds in these colonies, it's just an unbelievable place to visit. And just watch the, the albatrosses courting. And um, because they're not, they're not particularly accustomed to people, you can watch really from, from a close but respectful distance and see this amazing behavior up close and personal. Well, I, I didn't want to, um, to, to have my talk without including a really, really special bird. This bird is like no other that you've probably ever seen before. Um, it's called the striated caracara or known locally as the Johnny Rooks because they're thieves. Um, Charles Darwin visited the Falkland Islands nearly 200 years ago and he was mugged by these birds. They stole his hat, his gloves, and a range of other items um, uh, that they, they have a, a special behavior that they try and take and uh, are really inqu inquisitive about anything that they don't recognize. So I went and I was actually filming a TV series for the BBC and other channels. And I thought it'd be fun to, to see if they, they, they mug me. So I sat down amongst some of these, these striated caracaras and before I knew it, I turned my back and one of them had opened my bag. I had this little leather bag and had stolen my notes. <laughs> and um, another one um, was pecking at my bag. And while I was trying to get my notes back, another one stole my wallet and took out all the coins. They are incredible. I've never seen any species of bird that, that is quite as cheeky as these guys. They steal anything they can get their beaks on and fly off with them. And... Um, I actually made a little video for YouTube. You can you can look at it online if you just type in the wildlife of the Falkland Islands 
and you'll see these these cheeky birds stealing all of my my notes and my coins and and everything I I had. So it was just like um, Charles Darwin's visit, and I left yeah ha having been robbed by these birds. Well, I should also mention the Falkland Islands are home to many many endemic species. As you might remember from our last Nature Hour event, endemic means a species of animal or plant that occurs only in one location of the world and nowhere else. And this is definitely true for the Falkland Islands and especially for their birds, bird life. There's this unique Cobb's wren that is found nowhere else in the world, just here. And a special type of duck called the steamer duck that has really small wings and can't actually fly. Um, because um, because it, yeah, originally it, it, it occurred on islands where there were less, less predation than the mainland, so it evolved that characteristic. So there's some really, really special birds that occur nowhere else on Earth. So these are really interesting to see. Um, beyond birds, of course, it has some amazing marine mammals. Um, it has many South, Southern, sorry, South American sea lions and South American fur seals as well, subantarctic fur seals, sorry. These are the sea lions here with their big ruff um, of hair around their throats, which is said to be a little bit like a, the mane of a lion. And so they're, they're really interesting to see. And of course, it has big, spectacular elephant seals that battle on the beaches. These guys are huge. They can be many, many, many meters and tons in weight. Um, and they battle, the males come onto the beaches each winter and battle for their harems. Sorry, each, each, each summer, forgive me. Uh, I'm thinking Northern Hemisphere. Each, each um, summer from November to, to um, February or so, uh, they overwinter in the, the Southern Hemisphere summer here in the islands. And they fight with their, their big mouths with teeth and, and battle each other, almost like hammers, um, battling each other um, to take control of the beaches and the harems of females. There's one other really interesting animal um, that did occur on the Falkland Islands. Um, it was known as the wara, or colloquially as the, the Falkland Islands wolf. And it was a, a unique dog-like animal, a, a canine, that, that was distinct from all other canines in South America. It was endemic to the Falkland Islands. Very, very sadly though, Darwin, when, when he visited, he noted how easily it was being killed. People could just hold a piece of meat up and the, the wara would come because it was so tame and snatch the meat out of the hand and the, the person could then just kill the animal with a knife. And unfortunately that happened a lot in the 19th century and eventually they faded into extinction. So all we have today um, are some of the, the beautifully preserved bones of the wara in the Falkland Islands Museum and several other museums around the world. So a bit of a sad story in that this, this species did unfortunately become, become extinct. Um, but today there's some incredible conservation work taking place, including the restoration of many of the islands that had tussock grass and huge colonies of birds. Many of these were impacted by introduced rodents and, and particularly rats over the last 200 years. But the Falkland Island Conservation Team are doing incredible work restoring the tussock grass and um, and some of the, the removing the rat populations and some of the islands, as you you hear in, in Caroline's talk. So that's a very very quick overview. I'll, I'll stop there. I've got a deliberately got a, a blank slide here to um, to hand back to uh, to Joe because we will announce the competition winner of the stick and set competition uh, in a second after Caroline's talk. So um, a huge thank you for um, for listening to my quick overview of the. Um, of the wildlife of the Falklands and we've got three prizes to give away so I really hope the students uh, um, listen carefully and can take take part in in Joe's questions. All right well thanks Stu that was an amazing journey to the Falkland Islands hopefully it piqued our students uh, <laughs> curiosity to explore this this wild wilderness place that a lot of people don't know about. So uh, if you are ready for some Kahoot action and a shot at those three prizes those three Amazon gift cards I can see classrooms have joined already, but for those who haven't, I will pop this little banner here. If you head to kahoot.it, it is going to ask you for a PIN number. And I'm going to share my screen and give you that PIN number right now. Just bear with me for a moment. There we go. So you should see it now. You can see we've got lots of students here with their animal names, like the Stellar Gnu and the Fast Frog and the Jolly Dog. 
So your PIN number is 670-0041. If you have a one-to-one -one device at your desk, you can join right there. Uh, if not, your teacher could put it up at the front of the classroom. You could yell out your answers to him or her. Oh, lots of students coming in now. Um, if you have a device handy like a tablet or a phone, you could even scan this little QR code. So as more students join, a reminder, this will be three questions. Might be some true and false, might be some multiple choice. Um, you get the answer right, you're going to get some points. But more importantly, the quicker you get that right answer in, the more points you're going to get. If you get that wrong answer in really fast, we got nothing for you today. You need that right answer uh, as quickly as you can for those extra points. So a couple more seconds because students are still joining. If I look down the list, we've got lots of students coming in here behind the scenes, lots of classrooms. That's great. All right, I think it's slowed down. I think we're safe to start. Okay, here we go. All right, first question coming up there. About how many islands make up the Falkland Islands? That archipelago of islands. Was it two? Was it 50? Was it 200 or around 700? So about how many islands make up that group. Don't try and use that map. We can't see them all on that map. You'll never count them all. All right. 38 students went with around 700. I think it's somewhere around 740. Uh, great job, students. Let's see who's coming out on top. The Purple Yeti is holding down that top spot, but it is close. Stu, when you were there, about how many islands were you able to visit? Well, I only I didn't visit all of them. <laughs> I visited, I think, about thirty. Um, however, that's there's definitely more than that. Yeah. All right. Our next question is a quick true and false question. The capital of the Falkland Islands is Stanley. Is that true, or is that false? The capital of the Falkland Islands. We've got about five more seconds to get that answer in. Right. We know that is true. Most students went with true. And what does that do to our leaderboard? The Wonder Dingo has jumped into uh, first place. So this is what it all comes down to. It's still really tight. This is the final question. This is about penguins. How many penguin species are found in the Falkland Islands? Did Stu say there were two, five, seven, or ten species uh, of penguin found on the Falkland Islands? Oof. Most students went with five species. Absolutely correct. Now the fun part, our big prize winners. In third place, we have the adorable Raven. In second place, we have the Purple Yeti. And holding down that top spot, we've got the Wonder Dingo. All right. Good job, everybody. Congratulations to our winners. I'm going to share my email address in both the YouTube chat and in the private chat for the classrooms. If your student is one of those winners, the Yeti, the Dingo, or the Raven, send me a message and we'll set you up with your gift cards. All right, let's come back from that screen share now. Stu, there we go, another round of Kahoot in the books. That's some very clever students there, definitely. Well done for all of those correct, correct um, entries. So really, really well done for everyone for taking part. So many congrats. All right. I'm going to bring Caroline in with us live now, Stu, if you want to introduce her when she pops in and we'll let her take over and take us into some of her, her ocean explorations or ocean conservation. That'd be a pleasure. Well, it's an absolute honor to introduce Caroline to you today. She's one of the, the most inspiring conservationists that I've met and doing some incredible work across the, the Falkland Islands. So we're really, really thrilled and, and so grateful that she could, she could attend today. Uh, Caroline and I worked together on, on a number of books, uh, including one that we sent recently to 20,000 schools all across the UK about um, 
uh, about the wildlife of the Falkland Islands. So it's an, a great, great pleasure uh, to have Caroline here today. So thank you so much for, for, for attending. So uh, over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much, Stu. Uh, let me try and get my presentation up and running. Entire screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so uh, thanks very much for inviting me along to, to do this little talk. Um, I'm very fortunate that I work in the Falkland Islands. I live there for most of the year and I'm working for a small local charity in the islands called Falklands Conservation. And they do quite a lot of different work, some of which uh, Stu has already touched on. So we do seabird monitoring, um, keep an eye on the penguins and the albatross, make sure that everyone's healthy and the colonies are, are doing well. Um, we also do a lot of habitat restoration work, um, planting tussock grass and uh, yeah, looking after all the wild uh, plants and peat and some of those other local environments around the Falklands. And then we have a, a marine component, which is what I take care of, and that's monitoring the whales and dolphins around the Falklands. And that's what I'm going to talk about just now. So we have a lot of uh, different species around the Falkland Islands, I think around about 30 in total, but many of those live far from the coast in deep water, and so we don't really see much of them. So the species I'm going to tell you about are the ones that live around the coastline around the Falklands, that you can see fairly easily from shore most of these animals um, and they are you know it's a very special environment around the Falklands for the for, for cetaceans and by cetaceans we mean whales dolphins and porpoises so I'm working mostly on two species of whale and I'll start by telling you about those so this one is the first one it's called a say whale which a lot of people have never heard of. And that's because in most places around the world, it lives a long way from the coast. And it's not very common. It's actually globally endangered. Um, so, you know, the populations were hunted very heavily during the whaling period, and they are just starting to recover now. And we're starting to see a lot more of these whales in the Falklands and elsewhere. So this is a large whale. It's about 15 meters long on average and very long and sleek. And you can see it's got a big dorsal fin there, um, you know, sit situated quite far back on the back. And well, the way that we spot these is from these big tall blows that they, they produce in the bottom picture. So every time they come up and breathe, they produce this big blow. And we can see that from, you know, 10 kilometers away. So when we're out on the boat, this is the what we look for. And then we go up to the whales and we, we try and work with them and collect data. So you can see in both of these pictures that the say whales in the Falklands are occurring quite close to the coast. And this makes the islands really special because everywhere else in the world, they're usually a deep water species that no one sees. So we're in a, a very unique position in the Falklands being able to research this species. And the reason why the say whales come to the Falklands, they, they visit in the summer and in the autumn. That's the Southern Hemisphere summer and autumn, of course. So it's, it's different from ours up here in the north. Um, and they come there to feed. So this whale, if you can imagine, it's lying on its side at the surface. And you can see on the left hand side, the jaws are open. And inside that mouth, you can see all those um, baleen plates and, and those kind of swans of um, hair. And that's what they catch the food on. So this animal is gulping at the surface on some small crustaceans. And this is why they come to the Falklands every year. We see the same whales coming back every year. Um, and we're working hard at the moment to understand how many there are, whether they're recovering well from the whaling, and um, what are the important habitats for them around the Falklands. So that's the say whales. The second species I'm working with is this um, big old whale here called the southern right whale. And you can see, I mean, it's not so clear in this picture, but this is a very large animal. It's also about 15 meters long, but it's much, much wider. And it, some of you might be familiar because there's also a right whale in the northern hemisphere. And so the North Atlantic right whale lives along the coast of America and Canada on the east side. Um, and that species is some of you may know already, critically endangered and not doing very well because of entanglement in nets and they get hit by boats quite often. Um, so 
they're not doing well in in the uh, in the opposite in the southern hemisphere these southern right whales are, are doing pretty well and we think during the whaling era there was no more than 300 animals left at, at one point and now we've got several thousand animals across the southern hemisphere so this is a conservation success story and we're really lucky to have them coming um, to the Falkland Islands. And as you can see from this picture, they also can be very close to the coast. So they're really easy to see. People like to go out on the headlands and watch these whales along the coast. The other thing about right whales, both, both species, is that they're super friendly and often very curious about the boat. So in this picture, you can see the side of our research boat at the bottom of the picture. And this whale has come up and basically decided to have a look at us, see, what, see what's going on. Um, and we get these kind of encounters fairly regularly in the Falklands with friendly whales. And you can see that this would have made them very easy to harpoon during the whaling era because they are quite a friendly and approachable whale. And in fact, that's where they got their name from. So they were considered to be the right whale to kill. Now we like to call them the right whale to study. And the reason why these animals are coming to the Falklands um, is the opposite from the say whales. So these ones come to our near shore waters during the winter, and they like to spend the peak of the, the winter in the southern hemisphere around the Falkland Islands, and they come there to mate. So they come there for mating and socializing and maybe to have a bit of a rest and um, catch up with friends. So we see, again, we see some of the same whales um, coming back to the Falklands every year in this species as well. And in this photograph is, is, is a mating group. So you'll see uh, several males jostling with each other to mate with a female. And we see this very often in the Falklands. So it's, it's a pretty important area um, globally for this species as well. As Stu's already touched on, we've got um, a few different kinds of dolphin actually, but these two in particular. On the left, the lovely, uh, beautiful black and white dolphin is called the Cummerson's dolphin. And on the right, we've got this other kind of dolphin, which is Peel's dolphin. And, you, and you know, both of these dolphins occur only around South America. So in the world, their distribution is quite limited anyway to South America. And we have good populations of both of them in the Falklands. And these animals are found in the Falklands all year round. So we see them summer, winter, and they stay there for feeding, uh, resting, socializing, and they also have their babies in the Falklands. So in the top left picture here, you can see a, a small peels dolphin uh, with its mom. And in the bottom right, this animal is a, a baby Cummerson's dolphin. And you can see that even though the Cummerson's dolphins are a beautiful white and black coloration when they're big, the babies are actually quite dark and they're, they're born really dark and as they grow older they get that lovely white coloration and both of these dolphins are, are a lot of fun to work with um, they don't see a lot of boats so in the Falkland Islands there's really not that many um, places with boats it's limited to Stanley and then we get cruise ships coming occasionally but in the coastal waters around the islands we don't have any fishing so uh, Fishing is banned in the near shore waters and the habitats are fairly pristine and untouched by people and human activities. So these dolphins have a very happy life, very carefree life. They have uh, abundant food. They like to live around the kelp beds in the Falklands where they can probably catch some uh, benthic prey like octopus and maybe some small crustaceans and fish. And a lot of the time they just seem to rest up in these bays um, and, and play with each other and socialize. And when they see a boat, it's so unusual for them to see a boat that they, they greet every boat with a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, yeah, we love, we love working with these dolphins. So I'm just gonna tell you a small bit about how we actually study the whales um, around the Falklands. And in this picture, you can see me on the boat. Um, I'm the one in the middle there, I think, um, holding my camera. And this is a, a nice big say whale. So one of the main things that we're doing around the islands is collecting photo identification data. And, and what that means is taking really high quality photographs of uh, the key features on the different species. And then we make catalogues of all the distinctive individuals so that we can recognize them over time. So in this picture, you can see on the left, we've got um, the dorsal fins of a say whale. And these were taken in two different years. You can see 2019 and 2020. And this animal has a really distinctive dorsal fin. So you can see those little nicks in the dorsal fin at the top. 
And so we can recognize this animal over time. Maybe if I go out next year, I'll be able to photograph it again. And I'll compare with all the pictures we already took. And this way we build up a catalog and it helps us to understand how many whales there are and their movements and their distributions. So one of our say whales we, was actually photographed in Brazil as well. So we're able to look at where the whales are going to when they're not in the Falklands as well. And on the right, you can see here is a right whale. Um, they do not have dorsal fins, so we have to use the head pattern um, of this species. And you can see on the head of the animal is these patches of hardened skin. It's a bit like um, calluses on your foot or maybe your mum's foot. <laughs> um, and over time, these areas, they have um, little crustaceans live in them, lice and things. So they become this kind of yellowy colour, um, kind of mottled colour. And the pattern of these areas of hardened skin is unique to every animal. So again, we try and photograph the side of the heads with the right whales. And in the same way as with the say whales, we can then work out how many animals there are and where they're going, how long they're spending in the Falklands and that kind of thing. So this is a, a major part of the work that I do in the islands is, is photographing the animals like this. Another thing we're looking at is with the say whales at least, is what they're eating. Because we know that they come to the Falklands and they use it as a feeding ground and then they move away for the winter and they go somewhere else to have their babies. But the Falklands is a very important feeding ground in the Southern Hemisphere. And so these pictures on the left are actually of whale poo. So this whale's come up and it's done a poo at the surface and it leaves this big orange cloud that's full of um, little parts of crustaceans, it turns out. Um, so you can see on the right is all these little tiny lobster krill. And these are what the whales like to eat. They're just like a few centimeters long, um, these animals. And this is me trying to collect one of the poos. So it is what it sounds. It's like when, you, when you're when you clearing up after your dog, it's pretty much the same thing. So I take a net and I literally just scoop the poo um, and then it's put into little pots that we send away for analysis. So in this way, we can tell what the whales are eating and that helps us to understand why they're there and which areas might be most important for them. And um, we're also doing a little bit of acoustic work in the islands. So this picture on the left is in Stanley Harbour and we put down these devices in the sea and they can stay on the seabed for yeah five or six months um, recording continuously the noises that whales are making when they're communicating. Um, the picture on the bottom right is what this looks like after it's been on the seabed for a few months. So a lot of invertebrates um, grow on it and they, they, they're pretty messy when we pick them back up. But we can get really nice data off this. And this year we've been able to show that the say whales are singing in the Falkland Islands. And whale song had never been documented before for that species. And you maybe know already, but when whales sing, it's normally the males and they're singing to attract females. So we can understand now that the say whales are not just feeding in the islands, but that maybe there's some singing going on to attract females by the males. So there may be some reproductive behavior as well. And then this year we've started putting some satellite tags on the whales. Um, and so in the top picture on the left, you can see this is a say whale. And because they have nice big dorsal fins, it's very easy to put little tags onto those. The right whales don't have nice dorsal fins for attaching anything to. So those tags we have to attach um, to the body of the whale. So in the bottom left, you can just see that little silver disc um, on the shoulder of that whale. Um, so that's the tag. So both those animals were tagged this year. And on the right, you can see um, the tracks from one of the right whales. And this just gives you an indication of how far these animals can move and swim. So you can see um, the Falkland Islands there in the middle of that picture. And down at the bottom is the Antarctic Peninsula. And then we've got South America in the um, top left of that picture. So after we tagged this whale in the Falklands, it swam all the way down to Antarctica. And it spent several weeks down there feeding in one little area before it started to move up again. And at the moment, it's up there off, uh, off Argentina feeding in that area. So, and this has all happened in just a few months. So you really get an idea of how far these animals are capable of moving. And, um, and they surprise us all of the time because we did not think that a whale would go south to Antarctica in the middle of winter, but that's exactly what it did. So we're learning a lot about how whales migrate and the routes that they take and, and the reasons for going there. I mean, um, is different for all the species and we're learning all the time from this kind of tagging behavior. 
So that's just a really quick overview of some of the work that I've been doing with whales and dolphins in the Falklands. Um, you know, we're continuing on um, this next year. We'll be doing a little bit more of the uh, satellite tagging work. Um, and we have a website here at the, the bottom. Oh, sorry, that wasn't too good, was it? Um, we have a website at the bottom here where we'll give this to your teachers and you're able to log on the internet and actually see the routes that these whales are taking um, in real time as they're going. So every day, several times a day, these maps update with the latest positions of the whales. And um, we're really looking forward to seeing where they go over the next few months. Some of these tags will continue to, to work well into next year. So uh, they're going to provide a lot of data to us to understand you know, where the whales go and why. And this is really important for knowing how best to to, to manage the whales and how to conserve their habitats and the species that we're, we're looking at. Okay. All right. Yep. Caroline, thank you so much. That was awesome. I, uh, I love that, that, that phrase that you used, you know, back in the day that they were the right whales for hunting and now they're the right whales for studying. So that's really cool. I like that a lot. Let's bring Stu back in here now uh, as well. And then I think it's time we bring some classrooms in. We do a little Q&A action before uh, we have to, to sign off for today. So let's get that going right now. Um, okay, let's start with Mrs. Moore's crew. We've got Mrs. Moore's crew joining us. They are, where are they joining us from today? Winston-Salem in North Carolina. How are we doing today? Stay fine. Hey, Joe. Hey, hey everyone. <laughs> well, good to see you. All right, who's got a question for us? We do have a question for you. Which of your animals is your favorite to observe and or study? I guess that's for me. Um, well, my favorite, even when I was a child, actually, I had a book. My grandma bought me a book of dolphins, and I remember leafing through that as a, as a child, and the one that really jumped out at me was the Cummerson's dolphin this amazing little black and white species. Um, and I feel, you know, it's such an amazing privilege now to be able to be down there. And one of the reasons that I, I really wanted to go to the Falkland Islands was to see that species. And every time I see it now, I still get just as excited as the first time. So I would have to say the Cummins and Stolfin's my personal favorite, yeah. But the right whales are amazing to work with too. What about you, Stu? Who's your highlight down there? Uh, do you know what? <laughs> I'm a bit ashamed to say I, I have exactly the same answer um, as Caroline. They're so beautiful. They, they jump through the bow waves of boats and ride along those waters along the beaches. They're just so much fun. But also just the, the big, the big fat elephant seals on the beaches and how they how they, they battle over those females. They're just so spectacular and amazing as well. So I, I, I guess I guess I've got to I guess I've got to say. Um, the, the elephant seals as well. They're just so interesting to, to watch. All right. Mrs. Kalachi's crew are joining us. Some grade five sixes here in Canada. How are we doing grade five sixes? Oh, hello. There they are. <laughs> oh, I, th I don't think the mic came off. I think you might have missed the button. Oh, hello. There we go. Oh, no, <laughs> hit it twice. <laughs> Oh, I double tap. Sorry. It's okay. Hey, everyone. Hey, who has their question? All right. Cody. When were you in the Falkland Islands? Is my question. All right. So, Caroline, when or how often are you in the islands? Yeah. So, I went there for the first time in 2016 and I left there one month ago. <laughs> so currently I'm in the UK and I'll be going back to the Falkland Islands um, between Christmas and New Year. So I'm there, I'm there nine months out of the year. What about you, Stu? Well, I haven't actually been for a couple of years because of the COVID pandemic, but I'll be there in February. So um, so yeah, I, I, I haven't been for a few years, but but I, I yeah, I can't wait to get back down and, and see, see the islands again. So yeah, February for me. All right. We've got to visit another classroom this time. We've got Mr. Patrick's crew hanging out in London, Ontario. Some eighth graders. Let me bring them in front. Ah, hey, everyone. We have a question from Wea. What is the furthest distance you have seen a whale migrate on satellite? 
did surprise you how far it went? Yes, I mean, for the whales that we've tagged in the Falklands, the two species were quite different and the tags themselves are quite different. So the say whales, the times that the tags were on for, just stayed around the Falkland Islands and the batteries on those tags only lasted up to two months. So that whole time they stayed in the Falklands and didn't migrate anywhere. And we were expecting that because we know that they like to feed down there for several months out of the year um, before they move away. So that was the say whales didn't really go very far, but that's still interesting because it just shows how important the islands are. Um, and then the right whales, yeah, I mean the right whales they are they are travellers, and we know that this species can move from the Falkland Islands to South Africa. And then the tagging work that we've done in the islands has just showed the whale that I showed you in that track has gone all the way south to Antarctica and then all the way north, um, almost up to Brazil. So it's a super long way, really. And he's done all that in just a couple of months. So, um, yeah, it challenges what we think about as a migration, too, because I think normally when we talk about humpbacks and other whales, we think about them going from a breeding area to a feeding area. And that's it. But what we're actually seeing is that the whales, they'll go up, they'll go north, south, multiple times to different places within one one year. Um, so it does change what we think about in terms of whale migrations. All right, Florida, Florida. We got Mr. Lavogue's crew with us. It looks like they might have had to leave maybe for a class change, but did they leave a question, Mr. Lavogue? Yeah, absolutely. They left three. Um, they had a bunch prepared in advance. And then I believe Caroline mentioned about the fishing laws that rolls from the Falklands. And now all eyes shifted to me because we're in South Florida and fishing is what every kid does. And uh, so they were surprised that there were so many, like, we have lots of fishing, but we're allowed to fish. So are you saying that? Even the residents of the Falklands are not allowed to fish. How does that work? No, what I'm saying is there's there's a three nautical mile limit around the Falklands in which commercial fishing isn't allowed. Oh. So we're not, you know, there's no set nets, there's no trawlers, there's no longliners, and actually um, near shore there's not a huge number of fish, surprisingly. So um, and and that ban is because there's a lot of squid, a lot of commercial uh, fisheries focus on squid in the islands. It's a very big, important um, part of the economy, and the squid come in shore and lay their eggs in the kelp beds. So these kind of measures are to protect those fisheries. Um, but if you're a local person and you want to go fly fishing for trout, that's fine okay. with the permit. <laughs> they'll, they'll be happy to know that. <laughs> All right, very cool. So uh, we need to squeeze in a couple more classrooms. Caroline has to go shortly, but we can, uh, Stu will be able to stick around for a few extra questions, but I want to make sure we get one round in here with the, the main group. So New York, fifth graders with Mrs. Cottrell. Let me bring you in front and center. There they are. Hey, fifth graders. What's the temperature year around in the Falklands Islands? Yeah, we got it. The, the temperature year round in the Falklands. Yeah, so it varies quite a lot, actually, between the summer and the winter. Um, well, like it does in a lot of places. Um, in the summer, on a nice sunny day, it can be 20 Celsius. Now, you probably operate in Fahrenheit, and I don't know what that would be in Fahrenheit. Um, but 20, 20 degrees Celsius in summer. In the winter, it, it can be down to minus 5 or so. Sometimes when we're out on the boat with the right whales in winter, there's ice and snow on the boat and on the hills. So... That, that's kind of um, the extremes of hot and cold. All right. And then we have Mr. Atkinson's crew joining us in Barrie here in Ontario. Oh, Mr. Atkinson, the, the question's not coming through. And it's unmuted, so that's peculiar. Here we are. Got it. We're good now. What has helped the whale population recover from the big loss? Did you hear that? Uh, yeah, what, what has helped the whale populations recover from their uh, population loss? Yeah, so, I mean, basically they recovered because the whaling stopped is the short answer. Um, and once the whaling stopped, the, they became internationally protected, a lot of these species. Then they had the opportunity to for the populations to grow again. And that's exactly what's happening. And we're looking in the Southern Hemisphere because there's not so much land in the Southern Hemisphere. It's mostly ocean. 
And so there's not as much human activities down there that would stop the recovery. So the, the southern right whales and the say whales are simply recovering. Um, there's at the moment enough food. We don't know what climate change will do to these recoveries, but um, that's something that will become clear, I guess, in the future. But the problem, the thing that's stopping the North Atlantic right whale from recovering, as you may know, is the fact that that area lives in a place with lots of um, human activities. And so they are getting hit by ships and caught in fishing gear. Um, and so a, a population can't recover if it's still, if animals are still dying. And especially the, the females who might want to give birth to the calves, if they're dying, then a population can't recover. So at the moment in the Southern Hemisphere, everything's good. And most of the whale populations are starting to increase of almost all the species, but it's a little bit different for some other species and areas. All right. Caroline, I know that you have to run. Stu and I are going to stick around. We're going to take a few more questions and then we have a few announcements to share before we wrap up for today. But Caroline, before you go, I do want to share the link for classrooms to check out, bucklandsconservation.com. I'll also share the link to the whale tracking with them as well individually, uh, because I think that's really important and it'll be a fun thing for students to check out. And then what we can do as well, Caroline, is we can bring our classrooms in. I'd like to hear them get loud for a minute and give you a huge goodbye and thank you. So, so uh, boys and girls, do your thing. If you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you for Caroline before we continue on. Today. Oh. Wow. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Thanks for listening. All right. Caroline, thank you so much. We'll see you soon, hopefully. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, Stu, let's stick around. Let's do a couple more questions, uh, if there are some out there, and then we'll we'll do our announcements to wrap up. That sounds good. All right. So I know Mr. Patrick's crew was was waiting with another question, so I'm going to bring them back in. Of course. Ivan has a question. With pleasure. Have you had any scary or exciting accidents while working with whales or other animals? Well, <laughs> I, um, I, I, so I was filming a series, a TV series um, with humpback whales. It was actually a bit closer to Antarctica than it was Falklands, but nearby, very nearby. And we had a whole big group of, of humpback whales um, uh, breach right around the small boat. It was actually the boat that I showed you in that, the photos in my, my presentation earlier. And when they, when, they, when they breathe, basically, when they come out of the water and go... <laughs> and fire out their, their breath out of their blowhole. It, it's incredibly smelly and stinky. And um, the cameraman and I were actually on the side of the boat and one, one emerged out of the water right below us and sprayed us with its, its stinky breath. So I guess that was the, the closest accident, I suppose, that I've personally had with, with whales and dolphins down, down in the Southern Ocean. So yeah, probably that really. <laughs> That's a good question. All right. So give me a wave in any of the other classrooms if you want me to come for one more quick question before we make some cool announcements. All right, Ms. Kalachi's crew, I see yep, there. I have one here. Wave. All oh, right, great. Shani, um, how, how would you know a male whale from like a female whale? That is a really, really good question. It depends upon the species. Some species of whales and dolphins have different coloration between the sexes. Many of them have slightly different body shapes and different sizes. Others, it can actually be very difficult to tell between the males and females. But that is a really, really good question. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic uh, question. But yeah, I, for most species, though, it's quite clear by the, the body shape. And also there's some differences in the fin shapes as well. But you often have to look very carefully and it can be a bit tricky to tell them apart. All right. Great question. Uh, just check in quickly, Mrs. Moore's crew or Mr. Atkinson, give me a wave if you have one more question for us. Huh. Yep. Okay, Mr. Atkinson's crew. Oh, and we'll visit Mrs. Moore and then we'll make our announcements. Well, has there ever been a time when either of you had to save the life of any of the wildlife you discussed today? That another excellent question. And the answer, I, I can't speak for whales and dolphins, but I can speak for penguins and, and, and much of the bird life. Definitely, yes. Uh, many, many times we found um, bits of, of netting or fishing line or, or wire or just plastic waste wrapped around either the bird's arms or in one case, their neck as well. And um, in those cases, you have to very gently capture the bird, 
without stressing it too much and cut away the plastic because if you don't do that it will definitely die um so that's a really good question and, and unfortunately the answer is many times we've i've had to rescue the birds often in partnership with other conservationists we have to have to catch them together but yeah unfortunately and most of the reasons for it is plastic all right if you have some time today classrooms look up uh a whale uh it would be the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. So see on YouTube if they have a humpback whale video there. There was a whale that was caught in some fishing gear. It was wrapped right through its mouth. And so they, they were able to record the release where they were able to get the whale, the fishing gear off of the whale. So uh, it happens even with animals as large as whales. And then those are some pretty uh, intense rescues to try and get the gear off of them. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, North Carolina, final question. At what point in time did you decide this is the career path you wanted to follow? <laughs> well, I've personally always loved nature, even since I was a little, little kid. So I, I didn't really have a choice. Um, I, I do different conservation projects, but also different filming projects as well and documentary projects. Um, but I, I've always loved, loved, loved um, com trying to work as much as I possibly can with nature and been really honoured to work with, with the team down in in the Falkland Islands. So I, I guess the answer to your question is always, I've just had no choice ever since I was a little kid to, to go into this. All right. Well, Stu, let's get uh, to the announcement portion. I know there was a mini competition where you've collected yeah. some uh, some photos. So Absolutely. Yeah. I'll just share my screen and um, and hopefully you can then see. Um, so each each for each Nature Hour event, we give, oh, sorry, I have to go down to the bottom. Each Nature Hour event, we give away different prizes. Um, and um, this week's prize was a drawing competition. Children from all across, uh, sorry, from, well, from all across schools have been sending in drawings of different polar wildlife. So, for example, polar bears from the North Pole or, um, or pe whales, penguins and seals from the South Pole. Um, the judges, we had about 200 entries, and the judges decided that um, Vihan from Riverbridge School, R Riverbridge Primary School near London, was the winner. So um, uh, Vihan School is going to win a whole culture full of beautiful stick insects called jungle nymphs. So many, many, many congratulations to, to Vihan. For the next nature event, we have a mini jungle to give away. Uh, so you can grow lots of amazing plants in your classroom, both seeds and, and live plants. So we really hope that these um, these nature kits will help give you some really great inspiration and interest for, for looking into nature and, and rearing amazing plants and stick insects in your classroom because they're they're incredible to inspire passion for nature. Well, the last two bits from, from my side are basically to, to explain about the upcoming Darwin 200 voyage. We're going to be visiting the Falkland Islands next a year in January, so January 2024, so a year in year from next January. We're going to be doing live lectures from the Falkland Islands, hopefully showing you some of these amazing animals live via satellite link. So please, please keep stay tuned, ready for these events taking place. The Darwin 200 voyage is a, is a voyage aboard a an incredible tour ship called Ustaskilde, and we'll be going right the way around the world following Charles Darwin's journey on, on HMS Beagle. We'll be doing live events from all of these amazing ports around the world. This is the ship there, and these are some of the photos of its last visit to the, to, this is actually South Georgia, but still you, you see some of the amazing things that we'll be able to beam live from. And then last but not least, we've got future Nature Hour events coming. Uh, we, we're going to schedule them over, particularly over the start of next year, from the lost worlds of Venezuela, home to this amazing landscape of, of sculptured stone, to the lava lakes of Erta Ale in Ethiopia, and the unbelievable landscapes of sulfur um, nearby in Ethiopia. And then last but not least, the amazing landscapes of Madagascar with the unique eye and many other interesting animals from Madagascar. So we really, really hope that you can join us for those upcoming events and um, can take part in future future nature hour events with exploring by the seat of your pants so i guess that concludes the program from my side today and it's really great to, to to see you all and thank you so so much for attending all right well Stuart, that was phenomenal the last two events south georgia and this one have been a great start to this series uh i can't wait 
uh, for some new ones. I know you're going to be traveling a bit, so we, we might wait to the new year to get the new ones going, but that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and then if you want to catch the past recordings, so we'll have them posted up here at exploringbytheseat.com backslash Darwin 200. And then as we announce the new events, we'll put them up there as well for your classrooms to register uh, and join into those live events. Well, Stu, that was amazing today. We learned a ton about the Falkland Islands. We had our Kahoot action. So hopefully I get emails from our top three uh, winners there. Uh, and then, yeah, a huge shout out to the winner of the, the contest for the, the stick insect culture. That's really, really cool. Cool. Wonderful. And that do, please, the schools that have won, did won those prizes, do send over your email address. Otherwise, we can't contact you. So you, you need to, to send Joe an email. Then we'll send the vouchers straight away so you can buy um, educational items. So a big, big thank you for everyone taking part today. All right, we're going to sign out for today. We still have a few classrooms hanging out backstage. We'll give them another chance to say goodbye. Have a great week, everybody. Uh, we can't wait to see you next week. Our series. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.